Good day. Many of you may be familiar with the Sherlock Holmes story, Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Silver Blaze, where Sherlock Holmes solves the mystery by noticing that a dog didn't bark in the night. We've had an event rather similar to that over the last few days um, in the international media, or at least the western part of the international media, and it touches on Russia. Um, many of you may remember that uh, a week or so ago, the media, at least the West, the English language part of the Western media, were full of stories about how President Putin was losing his grip, how uh, Russia was in the grip of massive protests, how tens or even hundreds of thousands of Russians were turning out to protest against him, and how the return to Russia of the Russian dissident leader and blogger Alexei Navalny had galvanized opinion and had set in, tra in place a, a relative, a virtual tsunami of protest which would sweep Putin and his corrupt regime away. There were any number of stories that read like that in the Western newspapers and on Western television. Some of you may have noticed that all of those stories and all of those articles and uh, uh, television shows have suddenly stopped. But of course, there's been no explanation of why they have stopped. I think if we actually look at what happened, we will begin to get a, a clear sense. Firstly, it's important to say, and I've made the point in various programmes, both on my own channel, on this channel, and on my, our main channel, the Duran, that Navalny's support is in Russia is consistently and gravely overestimated in the West. He certainly does have some supporters and some followers, but the idea that he is popular in a way that would seriously challenge Putin and the government is completely wrong and utterly misplaced. Secondly, I have to say that Mr. Mr. Navalny has acted in a strange way since he returned to Russia and in a way that was almost calculated to make protests in his support less likely. Uh, I, I say that, I say almost calculated, because there's a lot about this whole affair which puzzles me, and I will return to it later in this programme. Anyway, firstly, let's catalogue what went wrong and the various missteps. The first serious misstep was this video that many people of you, many of you may have seen, about Putin's uh, supposed palace on the Black Sea, uh, the world's biggest bribe, and all of that. What I think many people in the West don't realise is that this is actually an old story. It goes back at least 10 years and originates with claims by a uh, Russian whistleblower or alleged whistleblower, uh, Mr Kolesnikov, who actually left Russia in, I think, 2010. Way back in 2011, the Financial Times carried out an investigation of this story and it looked through Mr. Kolesnikov's various uh, papers, the documentation which he produced, and it came up with this comment. Mr. Kolesnikov has no documentary e evidence the transactions were conducted on Mr. Putin's behalf. The transactions in question are those relating to the ownership of the so-called palace, or indeed any connect, uh, or indeed um, um, those that might suggest that the palace was built on behalf of Mr. Putin's proxies, but on his behalf. And the Financial Times also goes on to say the paper trail is relatively scanty, and though it shows various payments between the companies they do not amount to the $1 billion Mr. Kolesnikov alleges was spent on the palace in total. $1 billion, 
with the alleged cost of building this palace. And in fact, the Russian media has carried out its own investigations and it thinks that the true cost was closer to $20 million instead of $1 billion. So here we have an article by the Financial Times going back to 2011, which already casts doubt on this whole story of a palace by the Black Sea fitted out on Putin's behalf, either directly by himself, as, by the way, Kolesnikov originally alleged, or by Putin's friends, as Mr Navalny alleges in the recent video, which he has done. The trouble is that we actually know a great deal more about this building since 2011. We've been actually able to trace the true ownership of this building, and it seems to be owned now by a person called Arkady Rottenberg, unquestionably a, a billionaire, unquestionably somebody close to Putin, someone on a US sanctions list, but somebody who might want to own a building like this on his own terms. I may add that Mr. Rottenberg was not the original builder of, the, of this building. We know who that was, and we know the chain of ownership that, uh, whereby it eventually passed to him. We also know, and there have been plans produced, which show that this building, far from being any kind of palace, was originally an apartment hotel venture floated by a group of businessmen in the mid-2000s at a time when the Russian economy was booming on the eve of the 2008 financial crash. As happened with many ventures of this kind, not just, around, not just in Russia but around the world, the 2008 financial crash put a freeze on it and all building work at that point was stopped and seems not to have continued since. The result is that the building is unfinished and, in fact, no more than a shell. All those extraordinary pictures that appeared in the video, highlighting its interior, showing billiard rooms and uh, places well, with poles for strippers and all of those sort of things, which uh, appeared in Mr Navalny's video, it turns out are pure inventions, entirely the work of Photoshop. Now, all of this in Russia is known. I mean, it would have been possible, it was in fact easy to predict that the true owner would come forward, that the chain of ownership would be produced, that all the relevant documentation would be produced, and that people, Russian TV, would be invited to the site and would discover there not a complete palace, but an unfinished apartment hotel. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. And though the fact has not been widely reported in the West, it has undoubtedly damaged Mr Navalny's credibility within Russia. It, it is, in fact, incomprehensible to me that he picked on this particular topic, which had already been debunked, to actually make a video. Um, I would add that there's plenty of other topics that he could have chosen for a far more effective video than this one. Putin has, in fact, built a much bigger palace for his use in St. Petersburg, or I should say not exactly built, but renovated, which is the Constantin Palace, a vast Romanov-era construction, which he uses when he goes to St. Petersburg as his official residence and where he holds summits. I would add that this particular building, the Konstantin Palace, is well known to Russians. And when Putin is not there, it is available for open access. But all right, you can argue that the Konstantin Palace doesn't belong to Putin himself. So maybe there's no big issue to be made about it. But of course, there is lots of corruption that takes place in Russia. There's corruption by people who are close to Putin. 
why make a video on a transaction that is actually not corrupt instead of one that is? As for the building itself or the palace, if you like, it seems that Mr. Rottenberg, who is actually a construction magnate, intends to complete it. Well, we will see. But the one thing we can say with some confidence is that Putin himself has no connections to it. Anyway, the uh, fiasco, because that's what it was of the Putin palace video, was then followed by a series of other bizarre missteps. Firstly, there was one which Navalny himself cannot have predicted or expected, which was that he's uh, a, a former, another Russian opposition leader, the liberal opposition re leader, Grigory Yavlinsky, came out and put, a, put out a statement in which he criticised Navalny as a, a threat to democracy and highlighted Navalny's well-known anti-immigrant and nationalist views to c claim that Navalny is some sort, of, some sort of xenophobe. I have to say that in this particular statement, in my opinion, has possibly done as much damage to Mr. Yavlinsky as it has done to Mr. Navalny. It's well known that the two men dislike each other, and many Russians, at least many Russians on, on the side of the opposition, will have seen Mr. Yavlinsky's extraordinary statement as spectacularly ill-timed and an indicator of the feuding and jealousy that goes on and which exists within the Russian liberal opposition. But the fact is that the statement, whatever else it did, will have shown that Mr. Navalny does not have the support of all Russian liberals, or even most of them. He's in fact well known for being a difficult person to work with, and in fact, most other lib liberal politicians in Russia don't get on with him. Russian liberal politics, as a matter of fact, is deeply factionalised. Then, however, we had actual missteps taken by Navalny himself, and these relate to his three court appearances. One, over the decision by the Russian authorities to withdraw his parole, but most especially the two libel cases which have been brought against him by a 95-year-old war veteran and his family who complains that in a tweet Mr Navalny referred to this man as a traitor. Now, the trouble is that in those two court appearances, Mr Navalny acted in an extraordinary and very strange and a remarkable way. It turned out that what this man, this person who'd brought this complaint against him, this war veteran, had been asking for was nothing more than an apology. Instead, what he got was a stream of abuse from Navalny, from the courtroom itself. And this abuse, by the way, was directed not just at the man, but at his family. Apparently, this uh, man, this 95-year-old man, was so upset that he had to be taken to hospital and an ambulance had to be called. I should make it clear, by the way, that he was not in the courtroom. He was watching the, uh, tri uh, the trial or the hearing virtually. And in fact, the entire um, court hearing collapsed and disintegrated into chaos. At the adjourned hearing, Navalny behaved in a similar way, uh, making uh, incredibly crude comments about the man's family and about the judge, uh, uh, who seems to have been trying, if anything, to conduct a fair trial. He called the judge by a, a German SS rank, which, of course, in the circumstances and context of the trial, many people would have found shocking. And the result was a collapse into chaos and a massive forfeiting of support across Russia. I say this because the court hearings, as is usual in Russia, were filmed. Many people will have seen Navalny's behaviour in the court. And, of course, in Russia, 
the uh, uh, the people have a huge reverence to the few remaining war veterans who fought to defend Russia from Hitler's armies in the Second World War. And one fast way of losing support is to abuse them in the way that Navalny did. Unsurprisingly, after that debacle, Mr. Navalny's organisation, led by its uh, current organiser, a man called Leonid Volkov, decided to call the protests off. The protests had not been particularly well attended, contrary to what some of the media says. I know of two eyewitnesses who claim that the first protest uh, um, was attended by, uh, by no more than a few thousand people. That's the one in Moscow. And that the second protest by around half of that number. And in fact, it was clear that the protest movement was losing, out, losing steam even before these hearings took place. But the fact remains that Navalny's strange behaviour during these hearings um, undoubtedly lost him much support and much sympathy, which he had previously had. And then perhaps the most bizarre and extraordinary thing of all happened. And in fairness, it was not done by Navalny himself, but by uh, his uh, team, but especially by Mr. Volkov. Um, Mr. Volkov had a meeting with NATO officials, a virtual meeting, I should say, and I would add that he is not actually based in Russia. He is now based in Lithuania. But he had a meeting with NATO officials and having previously called off the protests after that meeting, he came out and announced that the protests had been called back on again. That, of course, played straight into the Russian the government narrative that Navalny and his supporters are Western agents and, and will have lost more support even to an, to an even greater extent. The protests, the renewed protests, by the way, was supposed to have happened over the course of the last weekend. You will have noticed that there was no reporting of them in the Western media, the dog that didn't bark that I was speaking about. In fact, there was one article which I found in the Times of London. The protest took the form of switching off lights in one's flat or apartment to show support. It was almost invisible and only a tiny number of people seemed to have participated. And indeed, it seems that this whole affair has ended in a bad debacle. So the result is that the protests have ended to all intents and purposes, at least for the time being. And Navalny, so far from being strengthened by them, seems to have been weakened while Mr Putin carries on much as before. There's actually been a rather plaintive article about this in one place, which is the Financial Times, which reads, Russian crackdown brings pro-Navalny protests to halt. And it contains uh, some really remarkable comments. It uh, uh, refers to a, man, a school teacher called Alexander Ryabchuk, um, in which he posted videos of a protest on his Instagram page. Apparently, he attended his, this protest. He lost, the, he lost his job as a result and was driven off uh, 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 social media. He's, um, uh, and now, apparently, he's uh, actually had a, short, a very short prison sentence of a few days. And, of course, um, he, the Financial Times reports him saying... I obeyed the law and my conscience. In fact, it's perhaps worth saying that the protests were illegally conducted because they took place in violation of Russia's pandemic regulations and their venues were not agreed with the police. But, put that aside, the overriding story of this article is of a protest movement which has, which has at least for the moment, failed. So... Why and how did we get here? Uh, firstly, I, I have to say that it does seem to me that Western governments and the Western media have once again shown with this affair 
uh, uh, their basic lack of understanding of Russia and of its domestic political situation. I find this very strange because there are, in fact, uh, um, considerable opinion polling evidence, indeed opinion polling evidence conducted by anti-government uh, uh, Russian polling agencies like Levada, which highlight um, Mr Navalny's lack of political support in the country, and also which highlight the very strong support that Mr Putin still has. Um, it does seem to me that there has been a fundamental problem of a lack of knowledge and understanding of Russia for some time, with far too many people following their wishes as opposed to the facts. But one has to ask and wonder about this very strange behaviour of Mr Navalny himself, this bizarre video which, as I said, would have damaged him more than the target, the intended target, which was Putin, and this odd behaviour in court. Now, there has been some speculation on some sites that uh, Mr Navalny uh, suffers from various medical conditions and that his behaviour in the hearings was due to the fact that he's not any longer receiving treatment for those conditions. There's even some speculation that relates this back to the original poisoning incident which took place in Tomsk. I am not going to speculate about that. I don't know. But what I will say is that I do find the whole thing extremely strange. Perhaps Mr Navalny himself overestimated the level of support he has in Russia and believed the Western stories which told him that hundreds of thousands of people would come out and protest on his behalf. Or perhaps in his own imagination, he is playing a long game. He imagines himself a Nelson Mandela who went to prison, stayed there for a long time and came out and quickly became president of his country. If so, then all I can say is that Mr. Mandela, Mr. Mandela's behaviour at the Rivonia trial, which sent him, sent him to prison, in his, is in stark and extraordinary contrast to Mr Navalny's behaviour at the various court hearings which he attended. If Mr Navalny does want to be a serious figure in Russian politics, both he and his team have a great deal to learn. Thank you for joining me um, in this programme. Please check me out both on this channel and on my other channels, including the one that I do with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo at the Duran. Please also check, check out Alex's channel. You'll find links under this video. Please also uh, look us up on our other platforms, BitChute, Library, Odyssey, Rumble and the rest. Please also support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal and via Bitcoin. And please check out our shop, find the great things that we have there. Since this is a video about Russia dealing with Mr Navalny, it would be wrong, I think, not to show you uh, my magic mug with the flag of the Russian Federation on it. Of course, we have flags of many countries on many of our products. You see this extraordinary sweatshirt with the flag of Scotland there. And here, of course, I have a hat, a Duran hat with the flag of Great Britain. You can find all these products and other wonderful products in our shop. Find the link below. And uh, please remember that you support the Duran by buying these great products from our shop. So have a great day. And I look forward to you joining me in my next programme.